Welcome to the Captain Paul Watson Foundation Captain's Chair event. Today, I'm joined with Brinkley Davies and Mike Coots and Captain Paul Watson. Thank you, you three, for joining us today. We, we really appreciate it, and uh, we're really looking forward to getting this started. Uh, Mike Coots is a surfer, a photographer, and also uh, a shark attack uh, survivor and an advocate for sharks. Brinkley Davies is a marine biologist, surfer, free diver, and also started the Balu Blue Foundation. I want to thank you both today for joining us. Um, before we start, though, uh, you both are, are into photography and videography. So I wanted to ask you both if you had any advice uh, for young photographers out there that might want to uh, get involved in taking uh, pictures of wildlife and, and share that message with the world. Uh, I would say that I would say that my my best advice is to get out in the water as much as you can, because um, that's how I learned. And yeah, because the, the more you're out there, the more you see stuff and then it just gets funner and funner each time. I think that uh, it's it's so rewarding when you spend time with an animal and then you go home and can look at that photo. <laughs> so that's that's kind of why I got into it. I would say. Um be patient and be curious. There are so many different subjects that are available to photograph all beautiful and unique in their own ways and not to strive for perfection early on, but just enjoy the process and have fun with it and see what you gravitate towards as a subject. And then from there, just really hone in and give it your best. Uh, that's great advice. So, so Paul, and, and furthering that, you've always had a, a photographer or a videographer on your ships. How vital is that uh, to your mission? Well, I've always felt that the most powerful weapon on the planet is the camera, and uh, it's very important to not only uh, document what we do, but also to gather evidence. And uh, there's nothing, uh, there's no better evidence than photographic or video uh, of, a, of a crime that's taking place. Uh, and so we've had not just one, but also numerous uh, photographers and videographers uh, on all the campaigns throughout the years. Thanks. So I, I do want to let our audience members get to know our panelists a little more. So Brinkley, could you maybe explain uh, your childhood and how that led to you becoming a marine biologist? Sure. Um, so I grew up on the coast in South Australia, which is so beautiful and really rugged and remote. And um, I grew up surfing since I was four uh competitively surfing all through my teenage years and was just spending a lot of time in places where there's not really any people but lots of marine wildlife um and one of the main <laughs> species that we would come across is great whites because they're really the only shark species that we see coastally um where a lot of the good waves are and I generally got curious um growing up and seeing sea lions and sharks and um, we get the big migrations of southern right whales um, and that kind of inspired me to learn more and at the same time I was doing lots of snorkeling with my family and kind of naturally led into free diving um, as well as wildlife rescue so a lot of the places where we were if we'd find things that were in need of help we were the only people there and so all of that kind of led into me wanting to go into a career in ocean conservation of some kind. So my surfing kind of led into me becoming an advocate in the surfing community where I was living at the time and then kind of in Australia for marine wildlife. Um, and then I went on to go to university and do a lot of volunteering in marine biology. I, I did my degree, but then I also volunteered in a, in a lot of wildlife rescue stuff. Um, and I think I did my first free diving course when I was 16 in South Australia, where we actually saw a great white and it was really bad visibility. Um, and since then, it's just been, you know, I've been all over the world and it's been absolutely amazing. And through, through free diving and, and shooting photos while free diving has been a massive avenue of kind of how, how to tell conservation stories. So all of that kind of led to where I am now, I guess. And could you also talk about the Balu Blue Foundation? Sure. So about six years ago, I was living on the west coast of South Australia where we have crazy, beautiful marine life and biodiversity in the Great Australian Bight. Um, and because I was spending so much time in the water, um, 
and driving to the surf, I was both seeing issues that were kind of not being tackled at all in that area in regards to like entanglement, um, a lot of discarded fishing nets and line from commercial fishing there um, and other plastics. And then also you had the issue of wildlife getting hit by cars on the way to remote coastal towns. And so I wanted to start something just within that community for awareness first and then also um, wildlife rescue. So we actually started off doing, I think I screened that um, that documentary before the flood <laughs> on a refrigerator truck. Like we kind of, there was like a group of us and we just screened it. It's like a heavily commercial fishing and farming town. So um, it was kind of well received, but, but uh, I was just trying to get more education out there because everyone kind of lives in a bubble in remote Australia and doesn't, doesn't realize like global impacts and impacts of what they're doing. Um, but a lot of people I think do care, but don't, they just live in their tunnel and don't, don't really want to expand out of it. So I was just trying to educate my friends and community. And then that was around the same time I got social media and it all kind of became easier to spread a message. Um, and so with, with Balu Blue, we started doing like little activations and beach cleanups, dive cleanups, um, like challenges on social media in regards to uh, like removing debris from the ocean just on a small scale. And then we also, we also went into assisting wildlife rescue. So for kangaroos, birds, um, wombats, all kinds of native wildlife in Australia that are regularly hit or hunted. Um, and so I've cared for a lot of joeys <laughs> and other birds and then also marine wildlife as well. So um, it's actually a big, a big gap in Australia is there's, especially in Western Australia and South Australia, there's a lot of small carers and a lot of small groups doing stuff, but there's no kind of like big hub or place to take things. And so a lot of the time things just get left and not helped. Um, and so that's something I started to tackle with a foundation. And, and since then, we've just kind of been growing naturally and working with so many great people across Australia. Um, so, yeah, one of our one of our main uh, like baseline things that we always have worked on is awareness because uh, it's just the key. I think a lot of people don't know what they're supporting. And then once they know, they change their, their ways in their day to day life. But then. We have, we have bigger goals, <laughs> but they'll come in the future. That's wonderful. So, and uh, I won't ask you to elaborate, but I know you raised a wallaroo and, and that story. Yes. <laughs> now, uh, that, if, we, if we have time at the end, I'd love for you to tell that story because um, that was sure. really touching. Um, so Mike, I, I did want to, you know, ask you the same question because I know you grew up in Hawaii. Uh, can you talk about your connection to the ocean uh, growing up in Hawaii? Yeah, I was born and raised on the Hawaiian island of Kauai. Um, fell in love from an early age with the ocean, with surfing, with diving. Um, can't really remember my first ocean experience, but I would have been maybe three or four years old. And I think I caught my first wave on a boogie board at four. And um, coming into my sort of my teens, I wanted to be a professional wave rider. A lot of my friends were transitioning into being a professional. And I was fortunate to join a surfing team. And um, I ate, slept, everything was about riding waves. That's all I could think of. And um, I graduated high school. This was in 1997. And um, that summer, we had a really bad um, run of waves. It was some of the smallest surf I'd ever seen. And we transitioned into the winter. And um, it was in late October. We saw on the forecast of incredible swell on the horizon and uh, decided to wake up early and go to the surf spot called Majors Bay. Um, it's a right-hand point break that goes into a sandbar and it's a, it's a really fun wave and it's on a military base um, called PMRF. And we got there that morning and I remember we were in a four by four vehicle and we opened the car door and this waft of the most disgusting, stinky smell that you could ever imagine sort of like flowed in the car. And we were like, oh, I don't know what this is, but you know, the eyes saw the most raddest waves ever and there wasn't anything stopping us. And um, my teammates and I, we all jumped out in the water um, and they all caught some beautiful rides right off the bat. And I was left um, out the back with another surfer I'd never surfed with before and saw a really nice wave coming. And I, I started paddling for it. I had been in a prone position um, for a little bit, just kind of motionless looking at the horizon and things. And as soon as I started paddling, a large tiger shark came up from underneath me. It grabbed onto both my legs. I felt an immense amount of pressure. 
zero pain. Um, just crazy pressure. Like all of you guys were just sitting on my legs. That's all I felt. And I knew I was getting attacked. It was very obvious. Um, I could see a, a really square nose in my chest and um, telltale sign of a tiger shark. And out of just total instinct, I punched it with my left hand. Um, it let go. I got back on my board and I looked at my index finger and it was cut open. I knew I was hurt. I had no idea about my leg. And I just started um, going as fast as I could to the beach paddling. And as I'm paddling, my right leg starts doing this crazy shake. I thought it was the shark finishing me off because when you're when you're laying down, you don't see what's behind you. And I looked over my shoulder and it was my leg perfectly severed off. Um, the shark did a really good job of making me an amputee right then and there and caught a little wave to the beach. My friend Kyle saw what was happening, took my leash, made a tourniquet, saved my life. Um, they threw me in the bed of a pickup truck. We went to the emergency room. I spent um, about a week or so in the hospital. I didn't have any animosity towards the shark. I just felt like I was in the wrong place at the wrong time. And that was it. And my road to recovery was really smooth. I was back in the water surfing about a month later. Um, been fortunate to have no bad dreams, flashbacks, nothing like that. And um, post shark attack, I was trying to figure out a way of, of making a career. Like the career of, of being a professional surfer was out the window and um, got a job working at a surf shop. First day, I got a really bad infection. And um, I just was thinking, you know, on Kauai, like all these jobs are tourism based or standing up a lot. And my surfing coach had cameras. And in the meantime, I had been tinkering off camera gears and um, camera gear, sorry. And my, um, some of my, my good friends were professional surfers. And I started photographing them and really got into photography and really loved shooting photos and had a chat with my mom about, you know, should I go off to college and study art? And um, it was like, this, this could be really cool. And went to Santa Barbara. I studied, um, portraiture at Brooks Institute of Photography for four years and fell in love with shooting people. I wanted to shoot girls in bikinis and be a, a swimsuit photographer. And about the last um, year of my, my um, college, I got a phone call from a shark attack survivor, Debbie. Um, she wanted to know if I wanted to get into shark conservation. And these were words I'd never heard before. I knew a lot of what we were, um, what sharks were doing to us. Um, hence myself, I had no idea what we were doing to sharks. And, uh, She's like, don't worry, watch on YouTube a documentary called Shark Water by the late Rob Stewart. I watched it that night and was absolutely blown away. Um, it was a number that came on the screen. 70 million um, sharks a year at that time were killed for shark fin soup. And I, I thought that was a typo. I thought there was no way that could be true. And I really had no idea of the importance of sharks in the oceans and sharks for our planet. And um, just felt, really felt compelled in my unique situation to do something. I called her back the next day. I was like, I, I I want to help. How can I help? And she's like, well, we're getting a small group of shark attack survivors to um, go to the Senate and speak out about sharks and try to get this bill passed. It was closing loopholes and shark fin. Um, went to DC and, and shared my story. And I piggybacked with the scientists and we were able to get that bill passed. And a few months after that, um, the timing was just sort of, it was crazy just back to back, but we had a bill here in Hawaii that um, made the possession of shark fins totally contraband, like having drugs. Like you couldn't have any bit of shark fin in any restaurants at your home, nothing like that. And we were able to get that bill passed. And I, I was um, able to go a few months after that to New York and speak to the United Nations about the importance of marine protected areas. And, and as, as that wrapped up, I got invited to go on a shark diving trip and I brought my camera. I really didn't know what to expect. And it was at Guadalupe Island with the Great Whites. And I remember just being absolutely mesmerized by looking at these white sharks underwater. And I felt like I was looking at a living dinosaur. And that night I looked at my laptop, I plugged in my memory card and was just like, wow, this is incredible. This is the ultimate muse. This is much better than shooting girls in bikinis. And mm -hmm. since then I've just tried to do my best to share my love of sharks, share why we need sharks in our oceans. Um, through social media, through storytelling. Um, I, I found that um, I think my talent is taking what I learned in school, sh uh, shooting people and bringing that underwater. I shoot a little differently, a little bit more unorthodox underwater. I don't use wide angles uh, like most people do. I use portrait lenses and I shoot sharks like I do people in a way. And I try to find something like a smile, a smirk, an emotion. Um, and I just, I think there's value in if we can see a little bit of ourselves in something, it's going to want to make us learn more about it um, and want to protect it. And I, I feel like that's been my life mission. And if you're to ask me that day, would I paddle out that morning knowing I would get attacked? Um, what how fulfilling my life has been since then and the, the purpose that I've had? Absolutely. Wow. That, that's incredible. 
So, so Paul, I, I wanted to ask you in, in, a, in a general sense, why are sharks so important to our oceans and to the planet in general? Well, sharks have been around for over 400 million years, and they're an absolutely essential part of uh, a marine ecosystem systems and uh, keeping everything in, in balance. And, uh, you know, we have to have apex predators in order to keep that uh, system uh, in, in balance. So um, a world without an ocean without sharks is uh, an ocean that's uh, deep, would be in deep trouble. Uh, and uh, the oceans uh, right now are the ocean itself is dying uh, in our time. And one of the things that's contributing to that is the uh, incredible slaughter of uh, sharks around the world in the tens of millions of sharks that are being killed. And uh, that has um, uh, consequences going into other ecosystems and other species. You know, every every fish in the ocean, uh, it, it's um, its speed, its camouflage, its behavior has been molded, has been defined by the fact that uh, sharks are there uh, being responsible for that, for those transformations uh, through evolution. So, yeah, uh, uh, an ocean without sharks is not a very healthy ocean at all. So can you all, anybody jump in, but can you all answer this is how do we get the general public to care about sharks? Oh, <laughs> it's a hard one, but I think it's, uh, I, in my experience, I mean, I'm on the same page as Mike with so much, so much that he said, because I guess like where, even where I live right now and where I grew up, um, we see sharks all the time. We dive with sharks most days. We see them in the surf here. Um, and I, I'm always trying to share exciting kind of information about them and yeah, stuff about their personalities and different traits, as well as their importance to, you know, the biodiversity in the ocean. Because um, I think people, especially where I live, for example, which is very similar to Hawaii, people come here to see the marine life and, and whale sharks and things that they think are not scary. Um, and especially if they've not grown up around the ocean, they just have this inbuilt fear. Um, I guess in Australia, it's a lot of us grew up on the coast um, and there are a big proportion of people in Australia that are aware of sharks and not scared of them, but especially in the surfing community, they also, they're kind of in the middle, like they don't care about them and they, they just kind of pretend that they're not there. Whereas, especially in surfing, I'm always trying to get surfers particularly to get involved in shark conservation projects and realize their importance. And one of the biggest, one of the biggest issues that we have in Australia with sharks is the nets that they put out um, and drum lining, which actually attract, attract sharks to areas um, and are killing lots of other things in the meantime, which are prey to sharks. And so it's like this big system that's so outdated um, and, and just doesn't work at all. And our government especially thinks that that's the solution. But really, it's just like my view has always been about coexisting. Um, and I think that the areas where they are, where there are attacks happening, are, especially on the east coast of Australia, are to do with depleted other areas, like, for example, their prey source and fisheries around the area. And yeah, so I'm, I'm always trying to share, share shark photography and videos and stuff that people are like, wow, that's beautiful instead of, wow, that's scary. And I think that was a, main, a massive thing for me when I worked on the Great White Boat. Um, there was like a couple of different companies working in the same area for Great Whites. And one of them used to sell, you know, T-shirts that said, I survived like a cage dive. So like feeding the fear factor of Great Whites and the other, the other boats were kind of about like, not showing too much burling and baiting and not showing the sharks smashing into the cages. Um, but just being able to be in the cage and see them swim past the cage and get out of the water and be like, oh, wow, they're not, you know, man eaters. They're just beautiful dinosaurs, as you said, Mike, that like great whites, especially are such amazing animals and they're such great apex predators. But we, there needs to be a level of respect um, for what they do for our oceans and, and them as an animal. And I think that's kind of what I've always been advocating for here because especially in Western Australia down south they they do a lot of targeted drum lining um up here where I live now it's there's a really good shark conservation community now because a lot of us are free divers and we see tigers a lot especially um 
and the odd great white <laughs> up here. But but yeah, there's a, there's a long way to come over this way in regards to people's mentality. Um, even in shark fishing, there's still a lot that goes on, which I'm sure probably still happens in Hawaii as well. But uh, yeah, I'm always trying to bridge the gap between um, the generation that wanted to kill every shark and and our generation now that's trying to trying to advocate for them, but but respect them at the same time. Um, I would say Hollywood's done a really good job of being Hollywood. Um, they've <laughs> yeah. made the shark as a demonic animal that's going to rip you out of the water the second you've you know step foot into it. And um, as as Brinkley mentioned, like I, I think there's a new generation shift to that. I think in the last ten years, there's sort of been this collective um, collective understanding of sharks are more than that. That they're more than just a set of eyes rolled back and jaws wide open biting something. Um, and, I, and I think a lot has to do with social media. A lot has to do maybe with the new generation that didn't grow up on Jaws. A lot has to do with YouTube. Um, but I feel really optimistic that the tide on this um, perception of sharks is shifting. Um, and it really needs to, that we need to understand that, you know, without sharks in our ocean, as, as Captain Watson said, we're not going to have an ocean. We're not going to have a life here on Earth. And um, I mean, you look at 400 million years, that's older than trees. They've been here through mass extinctions and everything on Earth literally died off with sharks or most things have died off with sharks. Um, that just says on its own that they're here for a vital reason. Um, and it, unfortunate that we've got science telling us these reasons and we're able to like sort of unlock these mysteries of the importance of sharks as a keystone species. And, and I, I feel the next generation, I, I get messages on social media all the time of people wanting to study sharks, wanting to get into biology. And I think that's, that's really hopeful. And I'm, I'm very optimistic on uh, what's, the, what's the future of our oceans and the future of people and passionate people about our seas. I think that as people like yourselves that are making that change come uh, about, uh, you know, I was I had the privilege of taking uh, Rob Stewart out uh, when he did the film Sharkwater, which came from uh, our, one of our ships, and uh, that film plus uh, you know working with people like uh, White Mike and other people throughout the years has really uh, illustrated how photography and uh, and videos and everything like that can reach a lot of people and change that uh, consciousness. Uh, the perception of sharks is just rather bizarre when you consider that every day a hundred million people go into the ocean and the average, uh, I think it, uh, the shark attacks average about six or seven every year. It's an incredible small um, amount. And in fact, it's more it's more dangerous to, to play golf than it is to go surfing or diving uh, because more more people die on golf courses every year from bee stings and lightning strikes and are killed by sharks. But, but trying to get that... Uh, you know, that idea across has been challenging, but it is it is coming about. And it, it's because of uh, people like yourselves who are making pe more and more people aware all the time. So so all all three of you at, at different points have talked about a connection with animals. Paul, you know, your famous story about the sperm whale, you looked into the eye of the sperm whale, he spared your life. Mike, uh, you've made a similar comment when you were at Tiger Beach in the Bahamas, you looked into the eye of a tiger shark and you said that, you know, you saw the creature's soul uh, when you looked into his eyes. And, and I know, Brinkley, you've talked extensively about the personality of animals when you're underwater and how people don't understand that all these different uh, animals have personalities. I actually, there's a, a spotted puffer fish where I live that has a really cool personality. He likes hanging out. He likes checking things out on the reef. I like seeing him. Most people think of fish as, you know, these brainless creatures that just swim around and eat things. But really, if you take the time to observe them, you get to know them. How can we, um, you know, make that connection with people that maybe, you know, somebody in middle America or someone in a city in Australia, how can they make a connection with animals is the answer that they need to get out in nature is the answer that they need to to be on a boat and see a whale shark uh, up close you know what, what do you all think um i'll go <laughs> um i i think this is something i think about all the time and and something that i get a lot of feedback about through social media because i uh, i guess a lot of my audience are nowhere near the ocean um and that's maybe the reason that they look at my videos is because that 
they're not as lucky, don't get to live in the places where I live and don't get to experience the things that I get to. And I think that's where storytelling is huge, um, especially with videography and photography, not just shooting photos and, and sharing a beautiful image, but telling a story behind a situation um, or a video. I've had countless experiences in the water that have just been mind blowing and, and sharing, sharing that in detail. And people are just like, whoa, I never even, you know, they never even thought that you could experience that with an animal, let alone like in the, in the ocean. Um, and on top of that, I think that it's great that I feel like a lot of the streaming platforms are showing not only nature documentaries, but um, conservation documentaries and people that aren't anywhere near nature are able to watch those and learn more. I agree uh, with Brinkley and I would say it, it's, if you have a chance to get in the ocean, you have a chance to go diving. Um, even if it's just right, you know, right next to the sand with a mask and snorkel, do it. Um, it really is nothing like being underwater and spending time underwater and, and observing what's around you. And, um, and if not, I would say, go and try to watch, watch films that are authentic. Um, I, I know there's a tendency and, and especially maybe in the, the shark world to not be authentic and, and try and show more jaws, roll, eyes roll back, stuff that can go viral because people want stuff to go viral. And majority of time a sharks, you know, being a shark and just swimming around and doing things and, and look to storytellers that are telling authentic stories. Um, it's, there's a lot of really good stuff out there. And, and um, I just, I think we're living in a really good age to either be able to get transportation to go diving or to watch it, you know, on a screen. Um, it's exciting stuff. And also to get people to have empathy for the sharks and, um, yes. you know, and see the, uh, you know, the, the, the finless uh, carcasses drifting to the bottom while still alive, uh, entangled in drift or gill nets and things like that this and uh you know to that, that provokes an empathy and understanding uh, and a need to want to to do things uh my personal experience with sharks has been more in trying to cut them out of uh drip nets and gill nets and uh and uh trying to stop them from being killed but um you know i think that that, that reaches a lot of people i mean uh, the understanding that sharks are, are are feeling creatures they're 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 sentient beings just like us that's a great point. And hey, I want to remind everyone that's uh, tuning in that if you'd like to ask a question for any one of our panelists or for them to uh, you know, ponder on, please go ahead and submit that. There's a Q&A button at the bottom and, and you could submit those questions. It all is depending on time. So if we do have time, we'll get to a few of them, but please do submit those. So the next topic I want to talk about is biodiversity because uh, you know, Mike, you being in Hawaii, extremely biodiverse place, a lot of endemic species. Uh, and frankly, same goes for Australia. I mean, that's a world all unto itself with lots of crazy creatures. Paul, and I'll let you start, Paul, because uh, I know you've spoken about biodiversity a lot. Why is biodiversity so important uh, to the planet? Well, we, we live in a, a culture which is very anthropocentric. That means uh, most people believe that it's all about us. Uh, everything was created for us. Everything is here for our use. We're the most important species on the planet. Uh, the biocentric point of view is uh, this understanding that we're part of everything and that everything is interdependent and that the strength of an ecosystem uh, depends upon diversity and the interdependence of the species within that diversity. So it's really an appreciation of uh, the role of all of these other species and uh, the connection to our own survival. We, we can't live in a world without sharks. We can't live in a world without worms or, or bees or microbes or trees. This is, these are all essential. So we have to learn to live in harmony with all of these other species if we're going to survive ourselves. Um, I, I would say, you know, from a human selfish point of view, biodiversity is beautiful to go diving and to be able to see so many different creatures underwater, colors, shapes, sizes. Um, it's beautiful, it's incredible, but more importantly, uh, it's a much needed function of our ocean. You look at areas where there's a lot of biodiversity, um, you have a lot of biomass, you have a, lot, you have a healthy reef ecosystem, um, you, you have a lot of top level predators and it's, you know, I'm not a biologist, but I, I, you see it, you see it firsthand when you're diving that you go to areas that have a, an immense amount of biodiversity, it's a healthy ocean. Yeah, I mean, I, agree in every sense with everything you both just said I think um especially when I studied biology 
it was there was this idea that you had to go on to just care and study one thing and one species and I think that's where I I was like oh I don't want to do that because everything works together and especially all the places I've lived and all the issues I've come across it's all about protecting that whole ecosystem because people are just you know plucking species out and for example like for fisheries or there's certain species that are suffering um, and then the more that humans have been taking out at each level it's like just creates so much imbalance in it I've always tried to spread the word about protecting whole areas because of it all working together. And just like you said, Mike, there's so many examples when you're diving where you see the impact of, um, of one thing being targeted or, or one little thing um, suffering and then the whole ecosystem flows on from that. So, yeah, I, the biodiversity in the places that I live is, is insane um, and it's very obvious to see how it all can be really balanced or really thrown out of balance. A good example is about you know since 1950 we've seen a uh, we've seen a 40% diminishment in phytoplankton populations in the sea, and phytoplankton provides up to 70% of the oxygen in the air we breathe and sequesters enormous amounts of CO2. Now, why has phytoplankton become diminished? It's because we've diminished so many other species that provide the nutrient base for the phytoplankton, the nitrogen, the 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 iron, the magnesium, and uh, you know, for instance, uh, one blue whale every day defecates three tons in to the sea, which floats on the surface and provides all of those nutrients. Whales and sharks and seabirds are all farmers of the sea, and their crop is phytoplankton. And phytoplankton is the foundation of life on the planet. If phytoplankton disappears, everything dies. And uh, that's why I say all the time, if the ocean dies, we die. And uh, so everything is linked that way. Through diversity uh, is our best protection. Phytoplankton can be protected through diversity. So my next question uh, for the three of you is about what what can people do? Because we've already we've talked about, you know, how can they make connections to the ocean? But what can people do to the in their daily lives to make a difference? Uh, is it, you know, maybe less plastic to help keep plastics out of our ocean? You know, if, if I'm someone living in, um, like I said, a city somewhere, you know, what, what could I do with my daily life to make a difference? I. Uh... I think that one thing that's really easy, especially in this day and age, that uh, is for people that are living in cities or places of huge populations where they're so removed from, from the natural world or knowing where their food comes from or all those factors is people are taking things like fish oil, krill oil as omega-3 supplements. Um, they're eating fish that they have no idea where it comes from. Uh, and that that goes onto all animal products. and. I, I have grown up in areas where people are not vegan, not vegetarian, um, commercial fishing heavy. And, and I stopped eating everything when I was about 16 um, and was ridiculed for it. But uh, I'm still here and <laughs> living healthily. And I think that it's 2023 and you can get great uh, nutrients from plant-based foods. And I think you don't have to I think if you're at least trying and changing a few simple things in your day-to-day -day life, you can make a huge collaborative impact, especially in places that there's huge populations. Um, knowing where your food comes from, A, and, and B, swapping out things that are just not necessary, like, like fish oil and krill oil, when you can get that from, you know, you can get full spectrum omegas from, from plant-based supplements. Um, and yeah, I think that's, there's obviously a lot of uh, other things that I do in my day-to-day -day life, um, but I think that that's one thing that everyone could take a step towards. I, I would say um, in retrospect, in, in respect to um, shark products is not consume shark products, not consume shark mm -hmm. in soup, don't consume any products that have sharks. Um, but also like an example is here in Hawaii, we've got a long line industry. Sharks are a huge bycatch of that. Um, they sell tuna to, restaurants and pokey restaurants and seafood chains across America. If um, I, I would say use your dollar wisely. If you are somebody that wants to eat seafood, ask where it comes from, be very cognizant of that. Um, and, and if you can buy seafood, if, if you do decide to eat seafood from the guy that's got a little boat down the road that goes out on weekends um, from a small boat fisherman, um, the bycatch rate of that is much, much less than large commercial scale fishing industries. Um, mm -hmm. Just really, I mean, you you have power with the way you spend money and, and to be just really conscious of that. 
I think the, the question of what people can do is really for people to find out what they're passionate about. And one, once you find out what you're passionate about is that then you take your skills and your abilities and put that to work towards making a difference. So with the understand then, it, understanding that each of us have the, the capacity to make that difference, to, to actually change the world and to not be deterred by criticism from other peoples, you know, focus on what needs to be done. And uh, I mean, because of Diane Fossey, we still have mountain gorillas in Rwanda. Uh, because of uh, Greta Thunberg, so many people became more aware of uh, of uh, climate change issues and that uh, because of David Wingate, the storm uh, petrel in Bermuda didn't go extinct. So it's amazing what one person can uh, can actually accomplish. So there's so much power in that. And also to understand that the solution to a seemingly impossible problem is to find the impossible answer. And that can be found through courage, imagination and uh, and and passion. Uh, and a good idea, uh, example of that in 1972, the very idea that Nelson Mandela would be president of South Africa one day was unthinkable or impossible, and yet the impossible became possible. So I always really rest on this idea that we can find impossible solutions. So we are going to transition to our question and answer uh, portion uh, of the captain's chair. Uh, we've got a lot of questions coming in, so I'm going to, you know, do my best to, to filter through some of them. So here's a question for the three of you. And this person writes, coming from an island based on the tourism industry, where do you draw the line between allowing people into specific ecosystems to create awareness on marine conservation and wanting to keep them out due to the ecosystem suffering from human impact? And this is to me. We can start with you. <laughs> yep, yep. I, I would say, um, like, like in Hawaii, that's a really hot topic right now. Um, we've got some marine protected areas that, like Honama Bay, for instance, you can't go on Sundays. Um, it was closed during COVID. They saw a huge amount of fish return. Um, I, I think the old way of thinking was to bring as many visitors as possible to the islands, um, and now it's to have visitors that are responsible stewards um, while they're here and. Um, I, th I think there's a balance that needs to be had. And it was really obvious during COVID when we had much, much less visitors, um, seeing many more monk seals on the beach, just seeing much more fish when you're snorkeling. And I, and I think there's a way of balancing that um, because it is great to have visitors in the water and learning about fish and learning about, you know, the, the beauty of the natural world. But then in, a, in another sense, it can't be too exploited. So you need to find sort of this balance. And, and that's that's being worked on right now. and And Fortunately, um, we've got some good policymakers that are actually looking at like that time during COVID. Um, Molokini, for example, is off Maui. It's a, it's a dive center. It's a dive. It's an island where a lot of the dive centers go to, and um, they didn't have any boats going out there for like two years. And so much fish came back, and especially um, some of the more of like the, the um, apex fish, like uh, the trevellies. And when tourism rebounded, it was like overnight. Um, some of those bigger fishes went off into the deep water and weren't sort of near the island. And I think they're looking at that and just hopefully can make some, some, some of the right decisions uh, for the future. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree so much, Mike. Um, in Australia, we definitely have, like where I live anyway, we have less, way, way less people uh, where I live is quite remote, but we have a big tourism industry, especially with whale sharks and a lot of my, the last decade has been traveling to spots which are kind of heavily tourism, um, marine tourism. And yeah, there's good examples and bad examples, but there's definitely areas I think that should be, uh, we should not be able to enter really at all. Um, and then there's areas that need to be managed better. We have very strict, um, there's very strict kind of laws and regulations in Australia, but there's always lines that are crossed. Um, but I think that it's so important to have tourism there. For example, where I live now, our tourism industry, which is mostly for whale sharks and seeing the Ningaloo Reef, which is World Heritage listed, um, we're all kind of fighting to protect it from oil and gas exploration at the moment and industrialization, um, which has, you know, huge threats to the Gulf, which is where I live, where it's a whale nursery. We've got dugongs out the front. Um, it's got crazy diversity in the in the lower trophic levels in the ocean out here. And because of tourism um, is the only reason why it's not being industrialized because the risk of losing, you know, that as a business um, is the reason it's not, it, it's not being put into those industries. Um, but at the same time, 
yeah, it has to be it has to be regulated to a point. And I'm I'm always pushing for more marine sanctuary zones, um, especially with with boating and tourism. A lot of people are definitely going way too fast and hitting things. Um, even in areas where there's good regulations, there is definitely like pollution um, and other impacts. And I think that making sure that it's controlled enough um, and everyone respects it if they're visiting. Definitely raising awareness if for the people working on the boats too or working in that area about the importance of driving slow and being a respectful visitor and that we're just visitors in the ocean um, and it's their home. Um, I think that's super important. There are places where we need very restrictive uh, access. Uh, I've been working uh, in the Galapagos, uh, well, since the 90s, and see, I've seen the steady destruction of ecosystems in the Galapagos because of tourism, in fact, uh, because of ecotourism. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when I first went to the Galapagos, I think there was 50,000 tourists a year. Now it's up to 300,000 a year. Mm -hmm. Now, what does that mean? Uh, the tourists come in and, the, they, you know, they want to have a steak dinner. Okay, let's bring some cows in from the mainland and raise them here. Oh, well, they want to eat fish. Okay, let's go out and get a lot more fish. Well, we want to go here and we want to go there and disrupt this. So when I first went there, uh, I mean, there were flamingos and and uh, iguanas on the main street of Puerto Ayora. And and, uh, and now, of course, you don't see any of that at all. When I first went there, there's only one place to make a telephone call. And now there's 24 Internet cafes. And, uh, you know, th uh, this is a, a sh shouldn't be. It should be totally restricted. There should be some places on this planet that we should not even set foot on. And yes. uh, it should be protected. I um, I also just I think that that's that's such an important point because, yeah, I've, I've actually been to the Galapagos and there's some places as well that. I, I was like, why is there people here? <laughs> it's one of those places where you just feel like there shouldn't be people there. Yeah. I mean, people are, are incredible when I say they have traffic jams in Galapagos. <laughs> it's insane. And also, I think that if you're, a, if you're a person that's visiting a place of such amazing biodiversity and that's really rare for humans to get to, I think that, you know, it, it's sometimes uncomfortable, uncomfortable to travel and you may not be able to sleep where you want or eat where you want. And that's something that humans should should adapt to they shouldn't get to have all the luxuries of like you know if they're visiting somewhere that's got that's rare to get to they have to adapt to what's available there we shouldn't change the the area you know that affects the animals well i've always said you know we should have travelers but not tourists exactly <laughs> yes <laughs> That's a really good point. And, and Mike, I can echo your sentiments about COVID because during COVID uh, here, uh, the beaches were pristine and, and we did notice there was more fish on the reefs uh, for sure. And uh, just, you know, saw spinner dolphins more often. Uh, there was just a lot more uh, going on here in Hawaii. So, uh, you know, I think having that time off uh, really helped a lot of the reefs uh, here and hopefully we can learn from that. So I, I did want to mm -hmm. ask, um, another question. Uh, this one is from Benjamin. Uh, he's asking, has there been any real progress made in reducing shark finning by China and other countries uh, responsible for killing so many sharks? Mike, do you want to start? <laughs> yeah, um, I, I would say um, starting with there's been a lot of um, Chinese celebrities speaking out against shark fins. Um, I think that's helped that I think the younger generation of kids on social media learning about sharks. Um, it doesn't have a strong cultural tie to um, Asian tradition. It's actually in, in the history of Asia, it's a fairly recent uh, cuisine. And I would also say, um, and, and I don't know if this is 100% true, but that there's, there's been a lot of um, families don't want to show wealth in China right now. Um, uh, it, it's a status symbol by having um, shark fin soup means that your family's wealthy. It's at banquets, it's at um, events, government events. And, and a lot of people don't want to be audited by the government right now. So they're really cutting down on showing their wealth. And that in turn is driving down the demand. And I, I hope that's true. Um, I, I don't know the numbers, but um, I could see if, if that was true, that would definitely drive down the demand. So I have another question. Um, and Paul, maybe you could answer this. Are there any uh, national governments that are doing good to protect sharks right now? Well, there are there are legislations in a lot of countries in Europe, the U.S., uh, Mexico, and different places to, to address that. Uh, so certainly uh, it's much more progressive than it was 10, 20, 30 years ago. So growing awareness is being uh, translated into legislative action uh, in, in many countries. So, so that's a good thing. 
So, uh, Brinkley, I have a question uh, from your neck of the woods. Uh, someone wants to know uh, regarding the nets out now in Australia, what is the most effective way to support this initiative? Uh, so Nets Out Now is a really, really great cause that we have going on for the shark nets on the East Coast, um, on the Gold Coast, which is, you know, where some of the best waves in Australia are and there's thousands of people in the lineups. Um, and Nets Out Now runs regular protests. Um, there's petitions, there's uh, drafted up letters and emails to local premiers and government, um, along with a lot of like content and photos and videos that we have people capturing that we're all sharing on social media, especially during whale season last year, there was, there was so many humpback whales during the migration that got caught in these nets, which is just insane off some of the most popular tourism and surfing beaches um, in Australia. And it's, it's mind blowing to me that they're still there even after what happened last year. And I think that the best way to get involved and spread the message is, is sharing um, what, what we all share on social media, plus signing the petitions, getting those emails um, to the governors. They're like sent to them directly um, and they got inundated with, with emails and you know pushes to ban it um, last year when it was all happening. And definitely there's more and more people attending the, the protests and the activations for it. Um, and th they're noticing and they're responding to it. So I think the more traction it gets, um, the closer we'll get to getting them pulled out of the water. So wonderful. So we have a, another uh, question here, and this one is about how do we, this is from Tom, how do we pressure governments to affect the protection side of the equation when it comes to regulations? I think earlier in the question, he had said that regulations are often just greenwashing exercises and don't really lead to much change. Anyone? <laughs> I feel like you might be able to answer this best. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think we just have to, to keep the pressure on and be relentless about this. Uh, again, through uh, uh, educating people, uh, through you know, especially through film and, and photography and stories and that. But uh, you know, uh, and getting and more people get involved, then the more pressure they put on politicians, and uh, that can that can make a difference. Um, one thing I wanted to add about the, the the shark nets and everything is that I have a theory that, uh, you know, the places where shark attacks are more prevalent, uh, I think is La Reunion Island, uh, Queensland and Western Australia. And what, what those three places have in common are shark control programs. And I think it's shark control programs that actually cause a lot of these shark attacks because they create an imbalance within the ecosystem that the sharks are in. For instance, in La Reunion, they go in and kill all the sharks, which creates a vacuum within the uh, along the coast there where they're killing the sharks, which brings in sharks, uh, like bull sharks especially, brings them into that area to fill that vacuum. And because these sharks are coming into the area, they tend to be much more aggressive than the sharks that were there because they're trying to establish their territory. And I think that they're actually contributing to the uh, these attacks by by these uh, methods of, of, of trying to cull or control sharks. Mm -hmm. I agree. I don't really think about that, but that's my idea on this. Yeah. No, yeah. it's it's a really good point. Like uh, when I was younger, I was surfing in South Australia and I used to go compete interstate. New South Wales, Queensland, you know, Ballina, Gold Coast, where all the attacks are now. And people used to call us crazy for surfing in South Australia because we have the biggest populations of great whites in Australia. Um, and they used to be like, I don't know how you surf down there. It's so dangerous and all that. And touch wood, uh, there's very, very few attacks. Um, in South Australia, we have lots of sea lions, lots of fish life. Um, we don't have shark control, control programs. Um, at, at all. Um, whereas over east, yeah, you've got the drum lines, you've got the nets. Um, there's a bunch of other stuff going on. And same, same in Western Australia, they went through the drum lining. And it, it's true what you said, uh, like, where those areas are is where they're all happening now, um, especially over east. And, you know, the other, the other thing is that on the east coast, for example, there's thousands of surfers in the lineup, and there's not much marine life. Um, there's not many big uh, schools of fish swimming around. A lot of the lower levels have been caught in the nets or being pushed further out. And so when a shark swims through the lineup, all that's there is people. So it's, it kind of makes sense that there would be more attacks. Um, so yeah, I think that there's, it's to do with imbalance on a major level. 
And, and we here in Hawaii had a shark culling program in the 70s, and there was a spike in shark attacks post that call. So I have another question. Uh, this one's a lighthearted question from Lakin. Uh, he'd like to know if you all have a favorite uh, species of shark. Oh, that's hard. <laughs> you go first, Mike. <laughs> I'd say a great white. Um, like we chatted yeah. earlier, there's just there's nothing underwater that looks like a great white. Um, it really does look like you're looking at a, a, a dinosaur. Um, they're big. They're smart. They're fast. Um, they're beautiful to photograph and there's just, you can really just feel their aura underwater. Um, there's nothing like it on earth. I, I'd have to agree. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I would say uh, tiger sharks because I found them to be the most fascinating to swim with. And uh, mm -hmm. my son's named Tiger, so. <laughs> oh, cool. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay, so I've got, I've got a big question here. This one's a, a little heavy. Um, this one comes from Ingrid. Uh, she wanted to ask uh, you all uh, how you address the lack of political will surrounding taking immediate and effective climate change action, especially given the urgent timeline required to avoid the tipping points. I, I'll start. I, I would say that's a really loaded question. Um, it's a great question. And, and I think in America, lobby groups um, follow the money. Uh, just the gas, the oil industry, um, the way things have been done, um, old school politics. I, I just, it's, it's money and it's lobbying, at least here in America. And that's, that's, that's my interpretation. It's, it's very much the same in Australia. Um, yeah, I think a lot of people have a, this idea of Australia as being like wildlife loving and environment loving. And we have like the biggest land-based wildlife slaughter in the world. Um, and that goes same for our, for our oceans. The, a lot of the uh, like commercial fishing and oil and gas, and it's all to do with the overseas industry. And it's super, super frustrating um, doing so much in, in the groups we do and being constantly ignored. Um, actually, just recently, there's been a few people get into politics over here that are, that are younger and more open-minded and more progressive thinking. And that's made me have a bit more, um, like a, be a bit more excited about um, where the future is heading, especially in the places I live. But it's, yeah, it's a constant battle of, um, they only really seem to notice when people protest or it, it makes the news or, you know, celebrities start sharing stuff. Um, and I think that's where the power of everyone working together comes in. I'm part of governments worldwide, there's a complete lack of economic and political motivation to actually address uh, the problem. And uh, if you take a look at it from any politician's point of view, if they were actually to come out and do something, uh, they would probably not get reelected again. Uh, <laughs> so you know, we're, we're seeing that in the US and in Europe and everything. Okay, well, let's do this. Well, you know, I'm not going to vote for that person because I'm going to be paying more money for gasoline now and I'm not going to do that. Uh, so it really comes down to people's self-interest, uh, which is uh, dictating how uh, these politicians uh, make their decisions. And also, from a politician's point of view, well, they only look ahead four years to the next election. They really don't care much about after that. We just got to get elected, and then we're going to do anything. And at all of these international conferences on, you know, COP twenty six or or environmental conferences, all they do is talk and talk and talk and promise to do everything tomorrow. I mean, I think New Zealand said they're going to stop offshore drilling in nineteen in twenty forty five. You know, <laughs> yeah. Canada said they're going to stop. Uh, Canada and Brazil said they're going to stop uh, clear cut logging in twenty thirty or twenty thirty five. Why don't they do it now? Because yeah. by the time twenty thirty or twenty thirty five comes, there'll be a new government. They say, oh yeah, well we'll do it in twenty sixty. Uh, you know, so that's they just keep passing the buck all the way down, and then they take words like sustainability. What does sustainability even mean anymore? It means business as usual, we'll just call it sustainable. So you actually have toothfish, which is being caught in the Southern Ocean, being flown into air uh, by airplanes to Paris or London and sold in restaurants as Chilean sea bass, and they call that a sustainable fishery. Where is the sustainability about that? There isn't any, it's just a word. You know, you have Austral fisheries in, in Australia saying we're a sustainable fishing company. No, they're not. They're going after an endangered species. It could never be a sustainable fishery. Yeah. Ever. If you want a sustainable fishing. fishery, get a guy, a guy going out in his canoe from the Philippines or the Congo and catching a fish on a line. That is a sustainable fishery. 
That's a great point. So the next question, Paul, is for you. Uh, this gentleman named Captain Jeff would like to know, uh, will Neptune's Navy have any vessels working towards the protection of shark populations? And how many vessels, Paul, are you expecting to join the Neptune's Navy fleet? Well, I can't really answer that question. We have one ship right now, and if we get more support, we'll have two and then maybe three. I actually say we, we're having a a second one, we do have a vessel on the Amazon now protecting uh, the river dolphin. Um, and that's working with Sea Shepherd Brazil, actually, which are working with us. Uh, but, uh, you know, right now we're trying to get our first ship off and we got eyes on securing a second ship. And that's what we want to do is build up a Navy that's there to protect uh, uh, wildlife, marine life in the ocean. And uh, it really depends on how much support we get, really. The more support, the more stronger we'll become. Well, you know, that, and that was one of my uh, questions that I actually didn't get to. Uh, we are pushing up on an hour, uh, but, but I will ask it now anyway, because you brought it up, which is, Paul, you're getting ready to, to sail with, with your crew to protect whales. Uh, Mike, you know, you're an advocate for sharks all over the place. And Brinkley, you're, you're helping uh, both land and sea animals in your neck of the woods in Australia. What is the best way for us to, to multiply our impact? and band together uh, all these different organizations and different people with passion in order to push the conservation movement forward. <laughs> it's going to go first. I, um, I have always been for working together with people. Obviously, um, it's, I guess, in the circles we're in, um, there are a lot of people that are fighting for the same thing. Um, and I think that the more of us there are, you know, the more powerful it is on a global level that there's a lot of people that still have no idea about anything that's going on. They live totally removed to all these, uh, you know, issues and, and the crisis that the ocean and planet's in. And I think that the more we're all speaking about it, the more we're all sharing about it, um, the more we can collaborate um, where possible. I think that that's, that's a really powerful way to get things done. No, I agree. We need to support each other's work and uh, publicize each other's work and contribute yes. where, we, where we can, uh, both in, uh, you know, funds and resources and advice and uh, that kind of thing. I would echo uh, what Captain Watson said earlier, that everybody's got a unique skill set. Um, if you're social, uh, start a social club on our oceans. Um, if you're a good writer, write opinion editorials to newspapers, to magazines about the importance of our oceans. Um, if you're financially well off, support NGOs with your money. If you have a lot of time and not much money, go and volunteer at, at a nonprofit that you find value in. Um, they're really like, there's only one of us, but all of us together um, is really gonna make a difference. And, and there's, there's no better time to start than right now. That's a great point, Mike. So, hey, I really appreciate your all's time. And, and what I'd like to do now is uh, kick it over to you all to let our audience members know how they can uh, get in touch with you both uh, and follow you. So let's start with Brinkley. Uh, what's the best way for them to um, get connected with your foundation? Uh, so we, I mean, on my, I have my Instagram and then we have uh, like Balu Blue has its own Instagram um, we've been actually working on developing an app, which is a wildlife rescue app um, over the last couple of years for both marine and, and land-based wildlife in Australia. It's proved to be really challenging to build. Um, apps are way more complicated than I imagined, but it basically will be like a, a tool um, that people can use. Um, and so the best way to get in touch is we have a website, we have an email. Um, I have my website, my email address, uh, and yeah. I always reply to those. So, and and that would be the Balu Blue Foundation dot org. Or... Yep. Okay. And then my website is just uh, brinkleydavies dot com. Okay. Perfect. And Mike, yep. how can people uh, get yep. in touch with you? Probably uh, the best way would just be Instagram. Um, at Mike Coots is my Instagram handle. I, I try to reply as uh, best as I can to DMs. Um, and if if you want to see some of my work, I've, I've spent the last year and a half working on a coffee table book on sharks. And very fortunate awesome. to have Captain Watson write the forward. Uh, it comes out in September. Um, and you can just Google my name and sharks and it's um, for sale pre-order. Okay, wonderful. Awesome. And Captain Watson, how can people support the Captain Paul Watson Foundation? 
I think the best way is to become a, a monthly donor, and that gives us a security going forward. Because you know, you have the ship, you have to have a monthly budget, and the best way to have a secure budget is to have a, a people who uh, donate, even if it's five dollars, ten dollars, doesn't matter. It, you know, that it's a secure, uh, a secure source of uh, funding. Okay, great. And I'll, I'll just add a few housekeeping notes. So to add on to what Paul said, if you do become a monthly donor, you become a, a pirate patron. Uh, which gets you 10% off at the uh, shop. So if you go to uh, shop.paulwatson.com, uh, you can see we have our uh, Neptune's Navy uh, merchandise there. Also, a uh, wonderful announcement is that the uh, Captain Paul Watson Foundation has earned its uh, 501c3 status. So if you are making donations to our foundation, they are uh, tax deductible going forward. Um, and then to further that too, uh, if you go to the donate button on our website, um, if your company does uh, matching or um, nonprofit giving, uh, you can type in your company's name. There's a search engine there. And if you just type in the company you work for, if it shows up, then they do have a, a matching program for donations. And if you would consider uh, use, or putting in the Captain Paul Watson Foundation uh, with your company, we would greatly appreciate it. So with that, I want to thank Captain Watson, Brinkley Davies, and Mike Coos for your time today. Thank you so much. It has been a pleasure speaking with you all. Thank you. It's been amazing. Thank you for having me. Thank you all. All right. I want to wish everyone a happy Earth Day weekend. And until the next time, we will talk to you later. Thanks so much, everybody. Thanks. Bye. Bye.